Uh, yeah, I'm going to talk about um, the interpretation of electric dipole moments. And I'm, a, I would say, a particle physicist. So that's a little bit the perspective. So basically, why do we care about these uh, experiments and what can we learn from them from the particle physics uh, point of view? So let me see if this works. You can see the slides advancing, right? Yes, we can. Thank okay, you. Okay, good. So uh, basically, there's uh, three parts of my talk. In the first one, I'll give a brief introduction to electric dipole moments, although Nick already did that on Tuesday. Then I'll talk about some uh, developments about how to interpret electric dipole moments within the standard model of particle physics. And finally, we'll go into beyond the standard model interpretations. So uh, very brief introduction. So the electric dipole moment is the counterpart of the magnetic dipole moment. And, and the magnet, magnetic dipole moment of, a, say, let's, talk, let's consider elementary particles for now for simplicity, is defined as the interaction between the spin and the magnetic field. And the electric dipole moment is then very similar. It's, it's the interaction between the spin and the electric field. And if you take this, uh, this particle here and you flip time in this picture, then what happens is that the spin rotates, goes into the other way, but the magnetic field that arises from a current, it would also flip sign. So the first term in the Hamiltonian, the magnetic dipole moment is invariant, but the electric field doesn't care about time. So it stays in the same direction. That means that the second term in the equation, the electric dipole moment would flip sign. So this means that if you measure um, a non-zero electric dipole moment, a non-zero D, then you have broken time reversal uh, symmetry. And then by the CPT theorem, if you assume special relativity under some conditions, it also means that CP is violated. Now, we know that CP is violated within the standard model of particle physics. It's actually extremely well measured in the decays of B mesons and uh, K ons and, uh, and D mesons nowadays. But um, for reasons that I'll explain later, um, the EDMs within the standard model from that weak interaction, they are extremely suppressed because they appear at very high loop level. And therefore, current experiments are not really sensitive to, to this source of CP violation that is well understood. Um, but maybe the suppression is actually not as big as we thought it would be. So uh, I'll talk about that later in the talk. Then there's a second source of, uh, of CP violation, sorry, and that is the, the QCD theta term. And the QCD theta term is a CP violation in the strong sector. We don't fully understand how this works very well. Uh, we are able to write down a CP violating term in QCD, which we expect to be there. But then if that term would be there, we would expect a very large electric dipole moment of the neutron. And I'll explain a little bit better how this goes later. But we don't see such an electric dipole moment and that forces that this angle theta, and there's actually an angle, I didn't write the sine theta here, but it's about smaller than 10 to the minus 10. And this is called the strong CP problem. And this is a huge topic of research for uh, particle physicists with hundred thousands of explanations how, how, this, how this comes about. Um, now in beyond the standard model physics, generically electric dipole moments can be a lot bigger. And for instance, if you would take uh, some supersymmetry model, uh, EDMs typically appear at one loop. And then you would get that the EDM of an elementary particle like the electron, there should be an equal sign here or an, an approximate sign. I don't know what happened here, is given by some loop factor alpha over pi to the power n, in this case, it will be one loop. Then typically it's proportional to the mass of the particle that you're considering divided by the scale of BSM physics. So this will be this lambda you could interpret as the masses of these supersymmetric particles flying around in the loop times some CP violating phase. So if you take this phase to be order one, it doesn't have to be, but if you take it to be order one, then if, if, if you have a model where an EDM is induced at one loop, then basically the current limits tell you that the scale of new physics has to be larger than about 30 TeV, which is very competitive with uh, limits from Large Hadron Collider or other kinds of, of searches for new physics. Um, could even be better. There are models where electric dipole moments are actually induced without any loop suppression. Um, examples are uh, left-right symmetric models where you get CP violating four quark operators at the at, at tree level, and then there's no loop suppression. And then you these four quark operators in turn uh, induce uh, EDMs of hadronic systems, or you could have semi-leptonic tree level CP violation where you get interactions between quarks and electrons. And if you would then compute uh, the limits you, you don't pay the price of this, this loop factor and, you, and lambda could be larger than, well, it depends a little bit on the model, but can range from 100 to 10,000 of TeV. 
uh, assuming that there are no small dimensionless numbers. So you can see that these EDM experiments are extremely sensitive to very large energy scales. Um, so that's a little bit of an introduction of why, why particle physicists care about these electric dipole moments. Um, and however, when we say that electric dipole moments are good probes for, for beyond the standard model source of CP violation, of course, we have to make sure that there's no background from CP violation within the standard model. So this is actually a quite an old story. So for instance, uh, uh, people uh, estimated how big the electric dipole moment of a quark would be arising from CP violation in the weak interaction. So these are just old, you can just in principle compute this in the standard model, but it's extremely complicated because it's a free loop diagram. And then what you end up with is that you get quark EDMs of about 10 to the minus 34 e centimeter. And that's also then roughly the size of the neutron EDM. So the current limit on the neutron EDM is about 10 to the minus 26 e centimeter. So we are about eight orders of magnitude away from these expectations. So this is extremely, extremely small. But this turns out not to be the relevant thing to compute because the EDM of a neutron is not dominated by the EDMs of the quarks. In fact, it turns out that it's more efficient within the standard model to first induce a CP violating operator among quarks where one of the quarks has strangeness. And then you use loops with, K, uh, with, with uh, strange mesons and strange baryons in the loops and you get certain long distance enhancements. And this was already pointed out by, by Kiplovich and Zidniski in, in the 80s and was recently updated. And if you do such an estimate, you get that the neutron EDM is about 10 to the minus 32 e centimeter, which is still six orders below the current limit, so we are still safe in that sense. So these these uh, these these computations are actually quite complicated, and they have at least an order of magnitude uncertainty. But it doesn't really matter; it's still very small. And and recent computations are in agreement with very old computations, so they are somewhat stable. Um, what about the electron EDM? The electron EDM itself in the standard model only appears at four loops. And that's because technically it, it, it's different from quarks because neutrinos have no mass. In the standard model, if you include neutrino masses, it doesn't really matter because they're so small. This is still the, the biggest thing. And roughly what you get if you just compute the EDM of the electron in, in with, with perturbative loops like this, you get about 10 to the minus 44 e centimeter, which is super tiny. It's 15 orders of magnitude below the current uh, ACME limit. So this is like impossible to reach probably. But again, this is not the thing that's actually uh, dominating the EDM of the electron, because it turns out that hadronic effects, that might be somewhat surprising because we're talking about a lepton, but it turns out that if you do, again, strangeness loops, so you, you also uh, know that via loops, the electron can couple to quarks, and then the quarks um, can couple to gluons. And if you then compute such hadronic things, there was a recent paper by Yamanaka and Yamaguchi in, uh, two years ago or so, they point out that the EDM of the electron from these loops is actually a little bit bigger. So it could be as big as 10 to the minus 39 e centimeter. But that's still ridiculously small. It's still 10 orders below the current, current limit. So we don't care. But again, we are comparing the wrong thing uh, because experiments, they do not measure the EDM of the electron but they use some system. And nowadays people use uh, molecular systems and before people used atomic systems. So you don't look at the electron in isolation, but there's also an effect coming from the CP violating forces between the electron and the nucleus. And um, this is typically done in the, in the following way. So you include, in addition to the EDM of the electron, you write down a CP violating interaction with the neutrons and or protons and the electron and this I gamma five here, make sure that the, that the EDM is CP violating. GF is the Fermi constant, it's just for normalization to make CS uh, dimensionless. And then you can compute what, what you measure in the experiment and it's a, some molecular factor times the electron EDM plus a contribution from the CP violating forces. And uh, it, it's useful then to write some sort of effective electron EDM, which is actually a system dependent statement. So for instance, thorium oxide, the effective electron EDM is the normal electron EDM plus a molecular factor that you have to compute for each system separately times this coupling constant CS, which is the CP violating force. Now, very recently, this is actually from like a month ago, uh, Ema Pospolov and collaborators, they reevaluated how big these CP violating forces are 
uh, in the standard model. And again, it's K-on, so it's always K-ons if you want to compute the most dominant thing. It turns out that the, the largest source comes from a K-on exchange between electrons and, and neutrons. And these forces themselves, if you look at the fundamental level, are, are coming from penguin diagrams. And in this way, the effective electron EDM, so that's not the electron EDM itself, but basically it's coming from this force thing, could be as big as 10 to the minus 35 e centimeter, um, which is still six orders below the present limit. Um, but you know, we gained like a factor of 100 in, uh, in a couple of, in a decade or so, maybe a bit longer. So maybe it's possible actually within 30 years or so to actually reach this, this standard model level. So before I was always thinking that CKM expressions are, are ridiculously way too tiny, but the new computations seem that they're somewhat bigger than, than, than I think people thought before, um, which is an interesting thing to, to, to know. Uh, so this is, uh, I, uh, if you're in this field, I, I recommend reading this paper by uh, Pospilov and collaborators. Um, what about the QCD theta term? And that's another source of CP violation in the standard model. It's a little bit harder to compute because it's, uh, it's, it's in, in inherently non-perturbative. It's strong dynamics at low energies. Um, so I'll just sketch a little bit how you, how you do this computation. So this is the, the Lagrangian for QCD, the quark kinetic term, the quark mass, and this theta term that you can add. And it turns out that it's for the computation, it's useful to perform a U1 transformation, an actual U1 transformation. And that's an anomalous transformation. So this is not a symmetry of the theory. Uh, it's anomalous. And what it does is if you shift, if you do this U1 transformation, you're, you can basically remove, you can use that transformation to kill the theta term in the gluon interactions. And in fact, the price to pay is that you get a complex quark mass. And this complex quark mass is proportional to the reduced quark mass. So in the reduced quark mass is, is given here. Then uh, the, the, the mass terms of QCD then become, you have the, the quark mass, the average quark mass, you have the quark mass splitting, which violates isospin symmetry, and then you have the CP violating term proportion to theta. And if you now uh, use chiral perturbation theory, you can figure out what is the main effect of such of these terms. So the normal quark mass induces the, the pion mass, the quark mass splitting, what it does is that it generates a splitting between the mass of protons and neutrons. And if you work out what the CP violating mass term does, it, it, that in, it induces at leading order a CP violating interactions between neutrons and pions. So this is an interaction like this, and it has a coupling constant G0. And in principle, you don't know this coupling constant, apart from the fact that it should be proportional to theta, but there's a QCD matrix element here that you don't know. But the nice thing is that there are certain tricks. There's a chiral symmetry relation between the proton neutral mass splitting and this G0. So this relation is given here. Basically, if you want to know how big this matrix element is, it's related to the strong part of the new proton neutral mass splitting. And this is actually very well known from lattice QCD. And in this way, you can calculate how big the CP violating coupling is as a function of theta. And the error is quite small. So we know roughly, if, if you tell me how big theta is in nature, I can tell you how big this CP violating pi on the gluon coupling is. And now the next thing is that you don't measure this CP violating coupling directly, but it generates a nucleon or neutron EDM at one loop. So you just close this loop and you put a photon somewhere. And then you get the following expression for the neutron EDM. It's some loop. And uh, if you then plug in the numbers, what you see is that the neutron EDM should be roughly minus 2.5 times 10 to the minus 16 theta bar E centimeter. And then if you plug in the current experimental limit, you get the strong CP problem, namely theta bar smaller than 10 to the minus 10, roughly. Um, unfortunately, I was cheating a little bit here because in practice, uh, this loop, if you actually compute it in the theory, it turns out to be divergent. And if you have a divergence in an effective field theory, you need a counter term to absorb it. So here, I, I neglected that. I basically set the divergence scale to be the nuclear mass. But in principle, there's a second contribution here coming from a counter term, a short distance operator. And KPT doesn't tell you anything about that short distance operator. So this, this bound should give you an order of magnitude bound, but it's not very precise because there's a leading order extra term that I didn't include. And in order to, to include that counter term, it seems that the only way to proceed is that you need a lattice QCD computation. Uh, and there's a lot of effort to do this lattice QCD computation. And there was a recent uh, result from Andrea Schindler, uh, which, which found that the neutron EDM is something like minus 1.5 plus or minus 
which you see is not that far from this chiroperturbation theory loop. Unfortunately, this lattice QCD computation is not being confirmed by other groups from Los Alamos or Cyprus. They actually don't find a non-zero EDM. And, and the, basically the current summary of these lattice computation is given on this slide. So different lattice groups try to calculate the coefficient relating the EDM uh, to theta, and this is in units of E Fermi. And they work, depending on the lattice group, they work at an unphysical pi in mass. And the hope is that if you do it at unphysical pi mass, you can use car perturbation theory to extrapolate to the physical point, which is here. Other groups actually work at the physical point, but then the price to pay is typically that you have a larger statistical uncertainty. But anyway, if you look at what the results are, it doesn't look so great. So lattice QCD doesn't really tell you that for a non-zero theta, that the neutron EDM is uh, non-zero, but the errors are still quite big. So if you would plug in the carbon perturbation theory estimate here, basically it still falls within this error band of this, this red uh, thing here. So basically lattice needs to improve by about one order of magnitude to make uh, better statements. And, and, and considering the number of groups that are involved, uh, this might actually be possible in the upcoming, upcoming years. But basically there's no first principle computation yet of the new, of, that's very convincing of a non-zero nucleon EDM coming from the theta term. Um, well, there's also other ways that you can, can probe theta. For instance, if you have these pion nucleon terms, they induce a CP violating nuclear force, and that induces EDMs of, uh, of nuclei and diamagnetic atoms. I'll talk about that later. And that gives you a very similar bound as the, as the naive neutron EDM bound, but it comes with a larger nuclear uncertainty, but it's roughly there. Now, what's interesting is, is that paramagnetic systems like thorium oxide or, or ethybitium fluoride uh, have become so precise that they are also becoming competitive in constraining the theta term. And, and this was, uh, the, the diagrams are somewhat like here. So basically what you can do is you can take a, a neutron in the nucleus, it emits a pi in from this theta term induced interaction. And then the pi in through the anomaly couples to two photons, which couples to electrons. So this induces a CP violating electron nucleon interaction. And if you put that in, uh, you get that that sets a limit on theta of about smaller than 10 to the minus eight. So it's still about two orders of magnitude weaker than coming from, uh, from the neutron EDM. But if you look at the progress in, in paramagnetic systems, it might very well be that in a number of years, uh, this sets the strongest limit on theta and no longer the neutron EDM. So I guess the what that means is that the, this distinction that we traditionally make in the field between paramagnetic and diamagnetic systems, where paramagnetic is sensitive to leptonic CP violation and diamagnetic is sensitive to hadronic CP violation, that's starting to lose its meaning because paramagnetic systems are actually maybe at some, maybe in a, in a decade or so more sensitive to hadronic CP violation. So I think that's an, uh, something to keep in mind. Okay. Um, sorry, how much time do I have left? You still got 10 minutes left. 10 minutes, okay. Uh, I can make it work. Let's see. Uh, so let's go into beyond the standard model physics. So, so basically right now we are at, 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 at a position where if we would measure a non-zero electric dipole moment, this would either be a non-zero theta term or it would be this beyond the standard model source of CP violation because the CKM phase is still at least five orders or so below the present limits. Um, so we don't have to worry about that yet. So the question is then, can we figure out what is what? Um, in order to do that, we need some sort of theoretical roadmap, which links us between the fundamental source of CP violation to the measurements that are being done on, on various systems. And of course, we need to understand that, that theoretically. So we need molecular atomic theory, nuclear theory, and QCD basically to, to go from one, uh, one side of the diagram to the other. Um, because electric dipole moments are extremely low energy uh, measurements, uh, we have a separation of scale. So we have some beyond the standard model source of CP violation that lives extremely high energies. And then we have to go to the electroweak scale, to hadronic scales, to nuclear scales, all the way to leptonic scale, uh, atomic scales. And this separation of scales suggests that an effective field theory approach uh, can be very useful. Uh, this is what we've been using over the, over the recent years. And the idea is basically that there's some fundamental theory with standard model fields and beyond the standard model fields. 
But if we look at this from a low energy perspective, um, essentially we these these beyond the standard model fields we don't have enough energy to produce them outside so they only appear as virtual particles in these diagrams and we can describe their effects by local terms um, and, and uh, the higher the dimension of these terms are the more suppressed they are so we only have to look at a subset of these effective operators basically what it means is that we are able to do low energy physics without knowing exactly what is out there uh, at the high scale so, uh, for example, in, in this the same diagram that I showed before, this supersymmetric uh, diagram, there are some supersymmetric particles in this loop. But if you look at this from a low energy perspective, they're basically just dipole operators between quarks, gauge bosons, and a Higgs field. And the Higgs field is there for electric symmetry breaking. It doesn't at low energies it, it becomes a VEF, so it's not so important. Or in, in you can have uh, the exchange of new W bosons, W rights that mix with W left. If you integrate them out, you just get a four quark operator that's suppressed by one over lambda squared, where lambda is the mass of these, these gauge bosons here. Um, this effective field theory approach is, is useful for several ways. It's useful because it makes the computation much easier. It's useful because you don't have to specify what model lives out there. You just map out all the effective operators and you consider them. And the other thing is that it becomes, it makes it very much easier to compare to other types of experiments. So I, I wanted to show a little bit of an interplay with Higgs physics. So for instance, in this effective field theory, there are several operators that, that involve the Higgs and that violate CP. And here I took a subset of them. So these, these phi's are the Higgs field. And then there are interactions between gauge bosons. So the W, Z, gamma, or, or the gluon. And there are four types of these operators that violate, that violate CP. And uh, at, at a high energy collider experiments at the LHC, what these kind of things, what these operators do is that they induce uh, certain angular distributions in the outgoing particles. So once the Higgs is produced, for instance, the Higgs decays, and you can look for the angular distributions, and then you can try to probe the CP violation. And it's quite active uh, part of research at, at, at the particle physics high energy community. But the same operators at one loop, they induce the EDMs of uh, electric dipole moments. And they also induce some, some flavor physics CP violation, like, like B2S gamma kind of things. And um, you can now, because of this, this, this effective field theory approach, it's quite easy to compare these kind of searches and you can put them in a single plot. So for instance, on the, on the, on the individual level, electric dipole moments put extremely strong limits on the individual coupling. So if you would only have one of these couplings at, at, at a time, then uh, EDMs blow everything out of the water. The limits are, are unprecedented. You cannot reach it anywhere else. But there are only a few EDM experiments actually that, uh, that are relevant. And there are more couplings than you have EDM experiments. So if you would do a fit where you include all four of them, then what you see is that and this, is a, uh, this is a four dimensional fit, but it's projected on a two dimensional plane. And this red line that you see here is basically from low energy experiments. It's basically dominated by EDMs. And you see that if one of these couplings is zero, then the limit on the other one is extremely small. But if you consider them both of them at the same time, there's some sort of free direction that appears in the space. On the other hand, the LHC is able is not so sensitive on the individual coupling, but it's able to close these kind of free directions here. So in this way, you're able to uh, model independently, constrain all sorts of CP violation in the Higgs by doing a combination of, of low energy experiments and high energy collisions at the same time. And the field is moving more and more towards these kind of global interpretations where we do not in include a single experiment at the time, but we try to involve uh, several things. Um, so basically, how do you do these kind of actual computations? I think I have to speed up a little bit uh, in view of time. Essentially, you start from this effective field theory point of view and you write down all sources of CP violation. You lower the energy scale. And then when you are at the scale of about a few GeV, you have a handful of operators left that violate CP. You have this QCD theta term. You have EDMs of quarks, uh, chromo EDMs of quarks, where you have a CP violate interaction among the gluon and quarks. So some stuff with gluon, some stuff with just quarks, and then some leptonic and semi-leptonic stuff. And these operators then in turn induce EDMs of all kinds of different systems. Um, so how could you unravel these different sources? Well, here I focused on the hadronic ones. They are a little bit harder to unravel. Um, all of them, they break CP. Um, but that doesn't mean that they're all the same because they have different 
properties on the other symmetries of QCD, such as isospin and chiral symmetry. And those different properties leads to a different pattern of, of electric dipole moments. So what you do is that for each source, you construct with chiral perturbation theory, the leading hadronic interaction. And it turns out that you get a bunch of about seven different types of, of interactions that you have to consider. You get these CP violating pionucleon couplings, pionic interactions, nucleon nucleon interactions, semi-leptonic interactions, and the electric dipole moments of, of, uh, of, of all kinds of neutrons, protons, and electrons, for instance. And then the next step is that you have to, would have to compute the EDMs of different systems in terms of these couplings. But you can see patterns emerging. So for instance, uh, to, to illustrate this, I, I focused on the pion nucleon terms, and there are two types of them. One of them is this G0 that was induced by the theta term, but there's a second one that you can write down, which is actually doesn't only violate CP, but it also violates isospin because it only couples to one, only the neutral pion. And then if you were to compute the ratio of these coupling constants, G0 over G1, then this is very telling of the source of CP violation that you're after. So for instance, for the theta term, this is a small number. And the reason it's small is because the theta term conserves isospin. But for some of these four quark operators, if you compute this ratio, you actually get a very large number because they are mainly isospin violating these operators. So if you could probe this ratio in an experiment, you could actually tell which is the source of CP violation, not only that the C CP is broken, but also which source was uh, responsible, so you could learn something about the fundamental theory of, of CP violation. Now, unfortunately, you cannot measure these ratios directly because no experiment is sensitive enough to measure pi on nu nucleon scattering with CP violation, so you have to measure them indirectly. But uh, basically how it works is that you can look at the nuclear force and then compute some uh, CP violating moment of a nucleus. So the easiest way to see this, and this is not I think experimentally right now, not being the most realistic option, but the easiest way to see it is to compute the EDM of the deuteron. So the EDM of the deuteron will be given by the EDMs of the neutrons and the protons. And then you have the CP violating force, which is actually because of the deuteron dominated by the isospin breaking source. Uh, why G1, this coefficient is so much bigger here than for G0 has to do with the spin isospin properties of, of the deuteron. And if you would now be able to measure the EDM of the deuteron and the EDM of the neutron, and you would take the ratio, what you would see is that for the theta term, that's a somewhat small number, but for these uh, quark color EDMs or for the four quark operators, they could actually be a lot bigger. So in principle, two measurements would be enough to already tell you something about is the theta term responsible or is something else uh, responsible. Of course, a deuteron is an ideal case because uh, it is quite easy to compute. So the uncertainties, the nuclear uncertainties that we have are relatively small. And that's why I picked this as an example. But in principle, you could do the same for something like mercury. So then you would have to compute the EDM of the mercury in terms of these different hadronic operators. And then you see that everything starts to contribute. So you have the EDMs of the individual systems. You have the EDMs of the pion nuclear force. You also have a contribution from the electron EDM and from semi-leptonic uh, sources. And what you also see is that because mercury is so complicated, the nuclear matrix elements are very uncertain. So uh, here you see uh, the arrow bands on this. These arrow bands are, are uh, taken by the review by uh, Engel and collaborators. Um, but it's essentially because the nuclear many body problem is so complicated. In addition, uh, what is not included in these kind of expressions are, are contributions from short range nuclear forces that violate CP, but they could also be relevant, but nobody has computed them, so we don't know where, what to put in here. And basically what it means is that if you want to interpret these mercury, for instance, systems in terms of fundamental physics, it's, it's kind of difficult right now because of this uncertainty, so we would like to improve this in the, in the future. Um, and that requires both nuclear theory, but also lattice that expresses these hadronic couplings in terms of the fundamental sources. I'm, I'm almost done um, if I'm over time. So um, in principle, these different systems allow you to unravel the source, but uh, yeah, you, need, uh, uh, you need theory input and, and we could do better on that front. So for instance, here you see a similar expression for the radium EDM where it's expected that the nuclear force dominates. And again, you see quite large uncertainties on these coefficients, although the one here is actually a lot better than, than, than before. Um, I just wanted to show two plots to illustrate this in a little bit better. So how could you now actually separate uh, different sources of CP violation um, in, uh, from, from EDM measurements? 
So uh, to illustrate this, I, I took two very simple models. One of them is a so-called leptocork model, where this is nowadays very popular because of flavor physics anomalies. But if you have a leptocork model, what it does is that if you integrate out the leptocork, you get a CP violating lepton quark interaction. Uh, and at the one loop level, you also get the EDMs of uh, electrons and quarks. And typically these electrons, uh, they are one loop induced. So you would expect this, the force, the, the four fermion operators here to be dominant, but you can get ratios of large quark masses over small lepton masses in these loops. So for instance, if you would have an internal top part, uh, internal top quark, this could actually be bigger because of this MT over ME ratio that you see in this thing, overcoming this alpha over four pi loop suppression. So for instance, you could imagine, um, uh, if I have a leptoquark model, which mainly couples to up quarks, I would get the four fermion operator. If I have one that mainly couples to top quarks, I would get the electric dipole moment. So could I separate this from, from different measurements? And the answer is, yeah, in principle, you could. So for instance, um, uh, for if an electron EDM is dominant, then you can compute the ratio of hafnium fluoride to thorium oxide, and you would get this green band here. Well, if the four fermion operators are dominant, you would get this red band. So if you would make a, uh, if you would detect a signal in both of these uh, systems, in principle, the ratio could differentiate between these two uh, scenarios. And the theory uncertainty is quite small here. It's because these are semi-leptonic. So these are mainly dominated by molecular matrix elements that are quite well under control. Um, I'll skip this. Now you can also look at a different model. For instance, this one is a little bit trickier. In the left-right model, um, dominant source of CP violation becomes a four-quark operator. And that leads to this large isovector nuclear force. So the question is, could you separate this, for instance, from the QCD theta term, if you were to measure this? And here you see how that looks like. So here I plot the ratio of the Deuteron EDM over the neutron EDM. And you can see that theta term predictions are very different from this left-right model, for instance. And for the Deuteron, the uncertainties are quite small still. If you do it with radium, uh, this two to five radium, that's also relative, the, then this isovector nuclear matrix element is also quite well understood. So you see you have a much bigger error band, but you could still separate them. If you would do it for mercury, uh, then with the current knowledge of the nuclear matrix elements, basically you get plots like this. So it's more difficult to separate these models simply because the uncertainty on the prediction is a lot larger but uh, with modest improvements of the nuclear theory you would get a picture that looks like this so also there you you, you could be sensitive to these things um, and i think i'm over time so i will just leave my conclusion slide here and uh, and thank you for your time thank you very much jordi uh, for the nice very nice presentation and we have time for uh, a quick question from the audience so if you have questions please uh, Raise your uh, your hand and uh, we'll call you up. Uh, one quick question. So I have a question about, you said, you mentioned that uh, no calculation uh, have been done uh, uh, of uh, uh, sources coming from the NN uh, the NN violating the interaction. Is that true also in very light systems? Like there is no calculation done in, in the deuteron or uh, no, yeah, so for the Deuteron it's special, it's because there um, you need uh, isospin violation and these short range operators are expected to conserve isospin and therefore they don't contribute. For helium free, they have been computed, but it's a little bit tricky because they're basically, basically what you're probing is the cutoff of your theory. Um, mm. So uh, depending on how you regulate the short distance part of the strong nuclear force, um, you get a different answer. So it's not a renormalized thing. Um, so basically, we don't know. The problem is a little bit that you don't know. The, there's no, no number to fit to. Uh, so uh, and, and there's no good way to get that, I think, unless you do lattice computations of these things. OK. Uh, welcome, everybody, and, uh, uh, to my presentation. And uh, first of all, before we start, I would like to uh, thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present our research and uh, also to lure us virtually to Trento. And um, in addition, I want to uh, thank my collaborators, uh, in particular Konstantin Gaul, Carsten Zürich and uh, Steffen Giesen from um, 
my team in Marburg, but also our longtime collaborator Timo Isayev and the colleagues uh, Andrei Zalczewski, uh, Leonid Skripnikov and uh, Nikolai Mosyagin, uh, as well as our experimental colleagues uh, within the SFB uh, uh, 1319 Elch, uh, Alexander Breyer and uh, Thomas Giesen, and uh, of course uh, Ronald uh, Garcia Ruiz uh, Silvio, who will give a talk later on, Kiran Flanagan and the Chris collaboration, and uh, also the Isolde team at CERN for the experimental part, um, which I will only flesh uh, briefly because uh, I was asked to talk about the theoretical aspects and this is what I will do. Um, the topic of the, the um, workshop is about uh, learning something about nuclear structure from atomic experiments. So we have seen the nuclear chart uh, quite often. And uh, the step then is that one, um, goes to the higher level atomic physics and try to learn something about nuclear physics and perhaps also about particle physics if we have just seen in Jordi's uh, talk. Um, now we would go one step further and look at molecular physics. And uh, of course there we could also look at uh, nuclear charge, radii and other important properties. Um, but molecules are particularly strong if we look at fundamental symmetries. So they would in particular mean time reverse and space inversion violation or permutation asymmetries which are broken, which we can then analyze in molecular systems. And uh, we have uh, mentioned um, that the possibilities uh, when you uh, take two nuclei instead of just one, they in, uh, have of course a lot of opportunities, but also challenges. And the first opportunities which we have is that we often have close line levels of opposite parity, which is very favorable for strong enhancements. Uh, the enhancement factors themselves they st uh, scale steeply with increasing nuclear charge. So um, the heavier the nuclei become, the, the stronger are typically the effects. And we have a large number of levels. And large number of levels means uh, that we always find a level which might be interesting for, for a particular purpose. Um, but on the other hand, uh, this is also a challenge because a large number of levels have to be described. And uh, for this, we need an accurate description, of course, which is challenging. There's also the question about laser cooling, which is very much advanced in atomic physics, um, but uh, has gained a lot of momentum now in molecular physics. And of course, what is good for us as uh, theoreticians is that the challenge is, of course, that the theory is more complicated because we don't have a spherical object, but rather have extended objects which we have to describe. Um, but the opportunities which we have um, motivated us to, to phrase uh, the term here, let the molecule do, do the job, because a molecule can be designed and selected such that we enhance certain properties which we want to uh, see enhanced and suppress others just by the right choice of the molecule. And some of the advantages you have already seen in the presentation by Nick Hutzler on Tuesday, uh, and today Silvio will, will talk about molecular systems and Anastasia Boschewski on Friday. So molecules um, have certain advantages, uh, which uh, are uh, discussed during this conference at, at uh, several stages. Now to the electronic structure description of uh, molecular systems. Um, First, we can have uh, two different uh, types of approaches. One would be that we start for light systems with the Schrödinger equation, which we solve for the electronic system in the attractive potential of the nuclei, or we solve the four component Dirac equation, which I've given here in the long version with all the four components written out, or we can write this in a more compact form in a two by two block structure so that we have an upper and a lower component. And in the old days, it was assumed that one, uh, for really accurate calculations, one always has to do everything four componently. Um, but uh, nowadays, um, one can go to very efficient two component approaches without sacrificing too much of the accuracy. And the approach which we are using is a two component framework for the description, which is called the two component zeroth order regular approximation framework um, developed by the authors, which are written down here. So the idea is that we take the lower two component of the equation, solve it for this chi, and then in this denominator, which we have here, we do a series expansion, which we stop at the zeroth order, so at the constant term. And now we have an approximate description for the lower component, which we can then use uh, in insert in the upper equation. And this gives us this equation, which we have to solve. So this is 
an effective uh, Hamiltonian, which we have, and uh, which can be made very accurately. So that is for the purely electronic Coulombic type of interactions, which we have. And if we want to go beyond this and include all the interesting effects, which we can have from the nuclei, we can try to incorporate this in a perturbative treatment. And as uh, Jordi has mentioned, of course, um, this kind of hierarchy, which we have, this really calls for an effective theory. And uh, here, for instance, I've shown the uh, parity odd effects, uh, for instance, nuclear spin dependent effects, which we can then in addition include perturbatively in order to, for instance, try to describe this nuclear spin dependent parity by lifting terms. For light systems, we would uh, choose the Schrödinger equation as a starting point. For heavy systems, we'll start with the Dirac picture. And then here we have Fermi's uh, weak constant and some prefactors. Here we have a constant which depends on the nucleus. And then we have alpha times the spin of the nucleus and then the nuclear uh, density distribution, which we can take here. And um, with this, we can, for instance, try to describe the nuclear anapole moment and uh, capture the effect of the nuclear anapole moment in a molecular system and um, uh, search for the enhancement factors which we get due to the fact that our nuclei are now embedded in a molecular system. Apart from the conventional standard model p odd effects, we can also go further and look at pt odd effects. So Jordi has mentioned the electric dipole moment of the electron, which we can also incorporate in this treatment and compute molecular enhancement factors, WD for this. We can also go for scalar pseudoscalar coupling constants and compute the WS factor for this. And as I've mentioned, this here is a four component picture, which I've used here. We transform all the operators in our work to a two component framework here, and then have to replace our operators in two different flavors for, uh, for uh, uh, HD. So for the dipole moment of the electron, there are two different strategies for doing this, which has been worked out by Lindroth and, uh, and Sanders. Um, and we use a two component uh, flavor of this, or for this uh, scalar pseudoscalar term, we have this kind of expression, which we are using then in an expectation value type of calculation. And with this, since our approach is very efficient, um, we can look at several diatomic molecules, which are open shell, for instance, and then go again a level in the hierarchy higher and have an effective spin rotational Hamiltonian where the electronic degrees of freedom, except for the spin I integrated out. And this here is the molecular Hamiltonian, which would be used in an experiment in order to analyze all the different contributions which we can have. Here in black, the very traditional parity uh, conserving terms and time reversal conserving terms, which one would normally analyze like the um, rotational constants and um, uh, this uh, spin uh, rotational constants, hyperfine coupling and so forth. Then we can include the anapole moment term and others here, uh, which are p odd, or we can even go further and look at the pt odd effects like the uh, WD times electric dipole moment of the electron. And uh, we can also go for nuclear spin dependent terms, which will play a role also later. And now, uh, with this type of approach, as uh, Jordi has mentioned, we can then relate uh, the effects which we can measure in atoms and molecules to some fundamental parameters to either um, uh, really the different constants which we have on the level of elementary particles or for the different nuclei. If we have, for instance, a dipole moment of the neutron or the proton, they can contribute to the shift moment or to a magnetic quadrupole moment of the nucleus in other terms, which will then induce an electric dipole moment in a molecule or an atom. And um, here, uh, when we want to look at different molecular systems, we rearrange the nuclear chart now in the periodic table of the elements, like the chemists typically like them. So here we have, for instance, a group two elements, uh, which are beryllium down to radium, for instance. Here we have group 17 with fluorine, for instance. We can go for the group 12, which is zinc, cadmium, mercury, and copernicium, and look at the hydrides, for instance. Those are open shell diatomic molecules, which could be relevant for doing an experiment. And then with this efficient approach, which we have, we can then calculate, for instance, a group two fluorides, which are indicated here with uh, uh, pluses, or the uh, group 12 hydrides here. And um, for us, it's not a problem if the nucleus is very short-lived, like in Copernicium, we can 
of course, as theoreticians make an estimate for the effect sizes. And here on this W logarithmic scale, we see here the nuclear charge and here WA, which is the underpole moment enhancement, which we have in molecular systems. And we see that even on this W logarithmic scale, it's increasing very dramatically here with increasing nuclear charge. And uh, this can be a, a, incorporated in a relativistic enhancement factor times the scaling behavior with Z. And here, typically for this effect, we have Z to the power of two, but there are also other effects in molecular systems that go with Z to the power of five. So this clearly means we have strong advantages if we go to the heavy elemental region and look there for um, favorable molecules. The same what we have do, done here for um, uh, P-odd effects, we can also do for P-T-odd effects and look at WS, for instance, or WD, the enhancement factors of the uh, electric dipole moment of the electron, or for the scalar pseudoscalar coupling. We can also try to work out this relativistic enhancement factor, plot here everything on a line, and here you see a zoo of uh, molecules for which we can do this kind of calculation. And then once we have done this kind of screening, we can search for molecules which are particularly favorable. For instance, here I show you radium fluoride, where we can then calculate for a host of uh, different properties, the enhancement factors, WT, WM, and so forth, uh, the shift moment enhancement factors. And then we can look at which uh, enhancements are particularly strong for a given molecule. So for instance, we find that the um, uh, nuclear magnetic quadrupole moments are strongly enhanced, comparable to ethereum fluoride or thorium oxide and radium fluoride, which is a very simple molecule with a very simple electronic structure. And then um, the question might be, yeah, are there other advantages of looking at radium fluoride? And indeed, that was the case why we looked in the beginning at radium fluoride, namely that we wanted to uh, see if radium fluoride might be laser coolable. And in 2010, together with Stephen Hoekstra, um, we uh, published a paper on the properties of radium fluoride and had calculated here the potential energy curves for two low-lying states. So we just calculate as a function of the distance between the two atoms here, the potential energy curves. And we see that we have a similar uh, um, equilibrium structure. So the minimum here is at the same position. We have a harmonic frequency, which is very similar. The dissociation is very, uh, energy is very similar in those states. And also the electronic transition energy is in a favorable reason for laser spectroscopy. So that looked all very good and suggested to us that this molecule might be laser cooled. I show you here the improved estimates from 2013 uh, from this archive work, but I would also like to point uh, you to a, a most recent paper um, uh, together with our colleagues um, uh, Zajczewski, uh, Skripnikov, and Mosyagin and Isayev, and also with our experimental colleagues, um, where uh, also other electronic states have been calculated much more accurately than we did it in this uh, early estimate. And uh, this gives uh, further indications for, for doing experiments in order to identify all the different electronic states. Now, what can be done for this and why it was uh, interesting? Well, uh, the point is that, um, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, laser cooling is a very much advanced technique in atomic systems. Uh, but for molecular systems, it was initially assumed that it's almost impossible to do this. And the reason was that if we have here the electronic ground state in some excited state and if we shine light in order uh, on this molecule in order to reach this lowest level here then it will be very likely to decay from here to the ground state back but also to other higher lying vibrational levels and this was initially assumed to be the killer for the idea for doing laser cooling with molecular systems until in 2004 de rosa pointed out a couple of criteria which would be important in order to make laser cooling possible also with diatomic molecules and he also proposed a couple of candidates for this and that was the motivation for us to look from a different perspective on diatomic molecules namely what are the recipes in order to find molecules which are laser coolable from electronic structure argument. 
orbitals. And then we did a classification of electrons in lone orbitals. We identified electrons in atomic-like orbitals and electrons in diffuse orbitals to be favorable for doing electronic transitions which are out without modifying the bonding situation in the diatomic molecule too much. And that would mean that we have similar um, um, uh, similar equilibrium distances, harmonic frequencies, and also um, the chance to go always up here and back down to the same level where we started from in a lot of cycles. And as has been pointed out, in order to, to survive 100,000 cycles, for instance, the so-called frank condon factors, which are the overlap integral squared between the two levels here, they have to be on the level of almost one. Right? And uh, to find such uh, systems, uh, we looked at uh, radium fluoride and proposed this as a molecule. And what was very nice when we did this work in 2010, it just happened around the same time that Dave DeMille uh, cooled strontium fluoride, which is just um, uh, two rows above radium. Uh, so this showed that in principle, this kind of concept works very well. And you can find more about this history here in this work. Then we thought, uh, can we extend this concept also to polyatomic molecules? And immediately a year after this, uh, on a conference in, in Boston, Timor highlighted that also the same concept can be applied to polyatomic molecules. We showed uh, explicit molecules on this conference in 2014 and published it finally in 2016 and proposed, for instance, calcium hydroxide, the isonitrile of this manganese um, uh, magnesium uh, methyl, and also the calcium uh, version of this as possible molecules. And as a chiral molecule with different isotopes, we have proposed this calcium CHDT, so where we have hydrogen, deuterium, and tritium here contained in the same molecule. And in the beginning, people asked us and said, well, this uh, appears to be very exotic to have this kind of chiral methyl group, but there's a long history about this. Um, and one can read more about this in this account of chemical research, because in bio, uh, chemical biology, um, this is used in order to follow um, digestion pathways of molecular systems for which uh, this kind of methyl group was very interesting. So it looked exotic, um, but um, uh, actually it is not that terribly exotic uh, from a chemist's point of view. Well, the question is, of course, when we do theory, how good are our predictions? And then it's very important to have experimental confirmation. And um, as I was asked to talk about the theory, I don't say much about this beautiful experiment, which was done at CERN with uh, Ronald Garcia Ruiz and uh, uh, co-workers. So the idea was uh, to use radium from a spallation source, create radium fluoride as an ion first, um, and then neutralize the mass selected radium fluoride ions um, with the help of sodium uh, to produce a neutral and then reionize the system in a clever laser scheme. This was a very complicated, intriguing setup in order to probe then the different electronic levels. And the good news for us was that here the vibrational structure, which one can see, clearly points to the possibility that this molecule is laser coolable because we see a very, very narrow um, transition the 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 2 transitions. So we assume them to have almost always the same uh, difference here uh, for the energy. And this uh, means that it will be very favorable for laser cooling. We can also look at um, off diagonal transitions, which are very much uh, uh, suppressed and also at other electronic states. And also our um, a theoretical prediction for the um, a transition frequency with very conservative error bars in these days. This agreed nicely with the experiment which was done at um, the CRIS um, and with the CRIS collaboration at CERN. And um, so this was a very good confirmation that this prediction worked. Now, the good news about this experiment is that one can now dial in different isotopes and measure for mass selected um, um, uh, molecules here, radium fluoride with different isotopes and also the transitions, which then opens up the door to do now experiments which are targeted towards different isotopes and look at different uh, properties of the isotopes, which we have then computed uh, and here the various molecular enhancement factors which we can have for the various 
um, radium um, fluoride properties. Um, uh, so for instance, uh, how a shift moment of uh, radium uh, nucleus would be enhanced or the scalar pseudoscalar coupling uh, or the WD, which uh, is the enhancement of the electric dipole moment of the electron. We use here our two component machinery with a very easy um, uh, independent particle model on the Hartree-Fock level or on the Dirac, uh, uh, on the Cohn-Charm level um, with an um, open shell description. So we use a, a complex generalized Hartree-Fock or Cohn-Charm framework um, to estimate uh, the effect sizes and uh, the collaboration with uh, Timo Isayev and other colleagues uh, and Toya Titov uh, from the PNPI gave us uh, the possibility um, to compare our approximate uh, approach with the um, uh, more advanced calculations which have been done earlier, for instance, for this kind of property. And we see that we have a very good agreement, which is for a uh, quick screening of possible molecules, um, uh, nearly ideal. And if we want then to look further into the specific properties, then one can go, for instance, for a couple of cluster treatments like it was done here in the friends one, which is cited down there. So here we see that we have different influences which can all contribute now to the electric dipole moment of the molecular system. And um, uh, this is very interesting for, for different uh, radium isotopes because we know that uh, for radium isotopes, there is also an octopole deformation. Uh, so for some of them, it has been uh, verified. And um, afterwards, we were discussing with Ronald, who pointed us to the uh, interesting case of the protactinium 229, which is discussed to have possibly a very strong optical deformation and therefore a huge enhancement of the nuclear shift. And uh, according to our information, it is very complicated to get uh, atomic protactinium. And the question was, uh, what then um, can we go for a molecular system in which we can confine protactinium? The electronic structure should be simple, not too, uh, too complicated with too many open shell electrons, which can then contribute to a very complicated electronic structure situation. And uh, we were looking now at the possibilities to find um, good candidate molecules for uh, doing an experiment with a two to nine protactinium, which can be mass selected. And now I want to switch gears a bit and, and connect to a topic which was also addressed earlier in this uh, workshop, namely the question of um, highly charged ions. So in the atomic case, and this we have seen uh, on the uh, first um, a day um, for, for atomic ions, we can go to very high charge states. So one can even have uh, uranium, what is it, 91 plus, so it's single, uh, uh, helium, uh, uh, sorry, uh, hydrogen like uranium, or other situations where we have uh, maybe here N on the level of three, four, five, six, seven, eight, um, up to 14, 24, whatever is favorable for the specific case to do an experiment with the atomic ions. And the typical argument is that one has uh, also an interesting transition from the Bartelung ordering of the neutral systems to the Coulombic ordering of the levels. One has a compressed level structure in those atomic um, highly charged ions, and also one has the possibility to uh, cool those ions sympathetically with lighter ions, which are very well controlled. So there are a lot of opportunities with atomic highly charged ions. And so the natural question for us was, how about molecular highly charged ions? Now, the naive picture is if we have a diatomic molecule and we put two charges on it, then at least uh, naively one would expect that the two charges are repelling the system so much that we observe what is called the Coulomb explosion. This is, of course, only for, uh, say, molecular uh, physicists, because in, in nuclear theory, you have a lot of uh, positive charges within the atomic nucleus, of course, but there is a much, much stronger nuclear uh, force, um, which uh, then, of course, the strong force keeps together the nucleus so that we don't have this Coulomb explosion immediately. But in molecular systems, we only have electric um, 
uh, interaction. So we have Coulombic interactions, which have to uh, keep the molecule together. So therefore, we cannot expect to get to very high charges. But what motivated us was a work here, which I have highlighted here by, by Helmut Schwarz, Delf Schröder, uh, Martin Diefenbach, and uh, uh, Klaputke, um, who looked at a triply charged uranium fluoride. So it was possible to generate stable triply charged diatomic molecule. And that is uh, very interesting. It's the only case uh, when n is equal to three observed in a diatomic molecule as a stable compound. There are metastable versions, um, but uh, to have a stable one, uh, this is not um, very common. And so we thought we should have a look at this. Here's a review article about uh, some easy estimates in order to find um, molecular systems which have um, a charge state higher than one. And we use this kind of argument and looked if, uh, at protactinium fluoride three plus and ask ourselves if this could be a stable, triply charged, so highly charged molecular. And indeed, we did the calculations and find that this is a very strongly bound system. So here, this is a potential energy curve, which we have calculated to this range, and then the isolated atoms. And we see that we have several EVs of um, binding strength uh, for this molecular system. And the Coulomb explosion pathway is a little bit lower, but not below the minimum which we have here for the binding situation. So this is a very favorable case for highly charged molecular ion, which can then, for instance, be produced in sympathetically laser uh, cooled with uh, strontium ions, which have roughly the same um, uh, mass to charge ratio, so uh, that the cooling uh, would be very efficient. And now we can look at several of the properties and compare this, for instance, to radium fluoride, because those two molecules are isoelectronic. So they have the same number of electrons, and therefore we can make a direct comparison. And what we observe here is that a couple of factors um, in protactinium fluoride are strongly suppressed. So WD and WS, they are strongly suppressed. So um, uh, whereas other factors like the shift moment uh, enhancement, this is very strong. And this is now a, a very favorable case because there should be a nuclear enhancement uh, for the electric, uh, for the collective shift moment. And we should also have a molecular enhancement, which is very favorable and larger than the one which we have for radium fluoride. And the question is now, why are the other factors suppressed? Uh, and this is due to the electronic structure situation, which we have in protactinium fluoride, because the unpaired electron is not in an essentially S-like orbital like in radium fluoride, but rather we occupy a, an F-type orbital. And uh, this has then an essentially zero probability to be at the position of the nucleus, which leads, uh, leads to this uh, strong suppression. We get now very many levels which are close by, which is interesting. And we can now calculate also for those different uh, electronic levels, the various enhancement factors. And this gives us favorable opportunities to do research on this molecular highly charged ion. So, then the question is, why is then the shift moment not strongly suppressed, uh, whereas the uh, other effects are suppressed in this F orbital situation? Here we have looked at the situation for radium fluoride and see that uh, from this uh, electron in the lone orbital, we get a certain contribution, but for the um, next lower lying electron pair, we get a negative uh, sign and uh, of uh, almost the same order of magnitude. So there we have a cancellation of the two effects, whereas in protactinium fluoride three plus, we have essentially zero contribution from the unpaired electron, but from the two electrons below and from the core, we have a stronger and both negative contributions. So here we have a certain enhancement in addition, and this makes the case very favorable for this molecular highly charged ion to search for the shift moment of the two to nine um, protactinium nucleus, which is predicted or at least assumed in some cases to uh, be strongly enhanced uh, due to octopole deformations in the nucleus. So with this, I see that I should come to the end, 28 uh, minutes, um, and I will just give you the short conclusion, um, namely, let the molecule do the job. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you very much for this very nice presentation. And uh, the floor is now open for uh, for questions. So if you have a question, please raise your uh, your hand and unmute yourself and uh, ask your question. No questions, comments for Robert? Okay, so I guess this is a very interesting program. Uh, do you have any um, uh, priorities or what system uh, would you like to uh, address first? So um, clearly radium fluoride would be the system which we want to continue to address. And um, because there are certain electronic uh, levels which uh, have not yet been found. And in addition, of course, there we want to continuously improve um, on the accuracy in the experimental investigation in order then to compare to what we can calculate in, uh, with our methods um, for the enhancement factors for the different properties. Um, for protactinium fluoride, we have to see now how the situation is experimentally. So is it uh, possible to create this molecule? And then we are also looking at other um, properties like uh, can we get enhancements, for instance, um, for a variation of fundamental constants and uh, other uh, very interesting properties, which might be also um, very sensitively probed with uh, the protactinium mines. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So thank you to the organizers for the invitation. Uh, in the next 30 minutes or so, I would like to give uh, an overview of the theoretical and computational framework that we use to study the structure of light nuclei. So one of the central goal of ab initio uh, nuclear theory is the microscopic understanding of the structure of a nuclear system, such as atomic nuclei and infinite matter, in terms of the interaction between the individual nucleons, as well as their interaction with the external probe. So now what we need in order to achieve this microscopic understanding of the nuclear uh, system is uh, the two body, um, the two body and many body interaction entering the no relativistic Hamiltonian. And also we need the consistent charge and current operator associated to this Hamiltonian. And, um, and also we need in a, a computational methods to solve uh, the many body, of course, Schrodinger equation. So recent, uh, clearly in recent years, there has been a dramatic increase in the scope of the ab initio framework. And this figure basically shows um, the trend of newly performed ab initio calculation uh, for nuclei with mass number um, equal to A. Now this ab initio explosion, it's mainly due to improved and novel uh, many body framework to the increase the computational resources, to the um, improvement in the nuclear interaction and current based on effective field theory, as well as try to uh, identify ways to uh, assess theoretical uh, uncertainty quantification. So now among these uh, ab initio methods, there are the quantum Monte Carlo methods. So those are a large family of computational methods that they are used to study complex quantum system. And we limit ourselves to a subset of these quantum Monte Carlo algorithms that for many years have been consistently applied to the many body nuclear problem. And these methods are the variational and cluster variation of Monte Carlo, and then the diffusion of Monte Carlo, which includes the green function of Monte Carlo and auxiliary field diffusion of Monte Carlo. Now, these, these methods, they work with uh, what we say bare interaction. We don't need to do any transformation on the inputs for uh, these many body methods, but they require a local representation in coordinate space of the Hamiltonian. This means that the interaction and current operators, they have to depend only on the momentum transfer that is given by the difference between the final moment of the nucleon and the initial moment of the nucleon in this amplitude. 
Now, those are stochastic methods. That means that they are basically based on recurs recursive sampling of a probability density. So therefore, the statistic error is quantifiable and also systematically improvable. So now I want to give a little bit of flavor of what uh, uh, these quantum Monte Carlo calculations are. So the quantum Monte Carlo calculation are generally performed in two steps. The first is the variational Monte Carlo, in which basically we minimize the expectation value of the Hamiltonian given a suitable parametrization of the trial wave function of the system that we want to study. So now we have a sophisticated trial wave function that really encode what we say the factorization between the short range dynamics and the long range dynamics, which is a common feature in the many body problem. So what we do is that we start from a reference state, which is the anti-symmetric single particle orbitals, which have appropriate uh, properties for the system that we want to study, meaning that the appropriate quantum numbers. And then we act with a pair and a triplet correlation on top of this reference, this reference state, which basically this correlation reflect the influence of the nuclear interaction at short distance. But we also have to satisfy asymptoting boundary condition of cluster separability since we are studying nuclei. So now, of course, these trial wave functions are characterized by parameters. And through a variational problem, we minimize, we find the best set of parameters in this trial wave function that give us the upper bound to the true state of the system that we want to uh, study. So now the accuracy of a quantum Monte Carlo calculation is basically limited by the knowledge of the trial wave function. So it's still a variational calculation. But then the uh, diffusion Monte Carlo, such as the Green function and the auxiliary field diffusion Monte Carlo can overcome the limitation of this variational calculation by projecting out the true state of the system by performing an imaginary time propagation. And this method is realized on the observation that the trial wave function can really be expanded as a complete set of the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. And then when we perform an imaginary time propagation, we tend to, to go to the true state that we want to uh, study. So now the evaluation of this uh, imaginary time propagation is done stochastically in a small time step, and it's based on basically green function formalism. And here an example how these uh, green function Monte Carlo calculation work, where we basically start from the, the variational um, calculation at tau equal to zero, and then we propagate in imaginary time, uh, in imaginary time, in a way that we find the convergence of our calculation. So now, after, of course, established the computational method to use uh, to calculate a nuclear system, we also need to specify now the inputs that they go in this calculation. So in the microscopic approach that we use, a nuclear system are basically considered as a collection of point-like nucleons, whose Hamiltonian basically is a non-relativistic Hamiltonian characterized by a non-relativistic one-body kinetic energy. Then we have two-body potential and three-body potential. In principle, we can have many body potential, but uh, current calculations are truncated to the inclusion of two and three-body force. So now the three body force, it's much smaller than the two body force, but in calculation of light nuclei, it is found to be crucial uh, to basically reproduce the experimental data. Now this realistic two body and three body interaction, they depends on parameters that we fit to nucleon, to nucleon nucleon scattering data in the case of the two nucleon force and to few nucleon experimental data in the case of the three body force. Now these fitted parameters, they really encode the underlying theory of quantum chromodynamics. So they basically encode our ignorance of what is happening basically at short distance because we cannot 
resolve for quark, and, quark and gluons, which are the fundamental degrees of freedom. Now, this realistic, the general features of these realistic potentials is that they include the one pion exchange contribution, and this represents, characterize the long range part of the interaction. And then we can have a mechanism that includes two pion exchange um, contribution with perhaps the excitation of the resonance of the nucleons. And also we can have in the context of chiral effective field theory, we can have contact interaction, which basically they describe the short range part of the interaction. Now, now of course, in order to define this two body and three body interaction, we, saw, we just said that we need experimental input because they are characterized by uh, parameters, but also we need to specify the theoretical framework in which we work, in which we derive this interaction. Now, in quantum Monte Carlo calculation, we used uh, the phenomenon, what we call the phenomenological interaction, uh, the argon V18 and Urbana 9 and argon V18 plus Illinois 7. And those interactions, they have the long range part characterized by the one pion exchange, while the intermediate and short range are basically treated in a phenomenological way. And then more recently, of course, uh, chiral effective field theory has been established as a popular tool basically to derive these nuclear forces. And we use in our quantum Monte Carlo calculation forces that they are local, that they are in coordinate space. And we use two families of this interaction that they have been developed recently. One including pion and nucleons as degrees of explicit degrees of freedom. And the other one, um, uh, which we will denote as the GT, Gezerlik's uh, uh, interaction. And then we have the, um, the other family of chiral interaction, with the, which include the pion, nucleon, and deltas as degrees of freedom. And those are uh, known in the literature as these Norfolk interaction. So now, what can we basically calculate now with all this framework that we have in place? Well, the first step is basically to try to test the theoretical model that we, we have. And the first, of course, the one of the many uh, important observables that we can try to test this interaction model is the calculation of the spectra of light nuclei. So here we report the calculation of the green function Monte Carlo calculation of the spectra of, of nuclei up to carbon 12. So, and we studied 37 different nuclear state in, in this light nuclei sector. And they are, this calculation involved the newly developed chiral interaction that they are compared with the more traditional, let's say, phenomenological interaction. Now, the agreement of these two models is a good um, with the experimental data with the basically if we compare the absolute energy um, or predicted by these two models, they are very close with the experiment, as well as the excited states, they are reproduced uh, pretty well. So uh, observing the ordering, which basically indicates um, a good spin orbit splitting in that we, we have in the, in the potential in the interaction. So so recently, also another way to see this calculation of energy is doing a, a, an energy ratio comparison. So recently, we have basically selected uh, results for nuclei using uh, this uh, newly local chiral interaction. And we also make a comparison between two quantum Monte Carlo methods, the auxiliary field uh, the green function Monte Carlo and the auxiliary field diffusion Monte Carlo. So here we have basically the energy ratio between quantum Monte Carlo results and experimental data using these two chiral model. So for let's say the red model, so those are chiral interaction that involve the delta excitation. The difference with the experimental data is less than uh, uh, 0.2 MeV per nucleon which we expect to be covered by the truncation error that we can access in this chiral interaction. While for here, for the blue um, 
interaction, we also have a good agreement uh, with the experimental data, but within their theoretical uncertainty quantification. So here for the uh, uh, interaction, the GT interaction, so we have um, uncertainty estimation coming from the theory, which is quite large, while for the um, um, red interaction, the Norfolk interaction, these error bars are only statistical errors, and we are planning to uh, go ahead with the uncertainty quantification coming from the theory. Now, a similar plot can also be uh, done for, for example, charge radii. So here we show charge radii with respect to the experimental data using, again, these two models of the interaction. So overall, there is um, a good agreement with the experimental data for, uh, for both models, except for, for example, one of these uh, Norfolk interaction does not predict well the charge radius. It's under predicted. Uh, in um, uh, lithium nine, and also it's under uh, it's overestimated. Um, it's slightly overestimating the, the calculation for the radius of carbon twelve. So now, of course, um, other type of calculation on the structure side, other type of calculation that we can perform in the quantum Monte Carlo methods is the single nucleon density. And here, basically, that is defined here. And here, um, we basically show the neutron and proton single nucleon density as a function, uh, as function of the distance. The different panels, basically, they represent the different interaction model. And overall, what we notice, of course, is that for nuclei that they have the same number of protons and neutrons, such as the helium-4, the single nucleon uh, momentum distribution is the same for neutron and proton. While also we notice that for nuclei that we call S-shell nuclei, um, with a number of particles less equal than four, we uh, observe that they have a large peak at large separation, while the P-shell nuclei, such as uh, lithium-6, for example, nuclei that they have a number of nucleons bigger than, equal than six, are much more reduced and small distances and much more spread out. So this can be basically explained to the cluster expansion, uh, to the cluster structure of these light P-shell nuclei, such as the alpha deuteron, for example, in, in lithium-6, which basically put the center of mass of these nuclei in between the cluster and therefore reduces the uh, central density. Now, as opposed to uh, charge radii, of course, density are not observables themselves. However, the single nucleon density can be related to the longitudinal form factor or uh, what we call the charge form factor, which is a physical quantity that can be experimentally accessible via elastic electron nuclear scattering processes. And here is an example of the charge form factor in H equal six and A equal 12. So those are two calculation of the longitudinal form factor using again, the two chiral interaction um, and the compared with the more traditional phenomenological color interaction. And those are calculation performed, the red are performed with the green function of Monte Carlo and the blue are performed with the auxiliary field diffusion Monte Carlo. So in lithium-6, uh, let's say that all the uh, interaction model, they give a consistent description of the charge form factor. So for example, the uh, red and the, um, and the black, they basically describe quite well the experimental data up to momentum transfer of roughly two Fermi minus one. But for example, for the year interaction in blue, there is a slightly, um, they are slightly high, the form factor is slightly higher. And this is also associated, for example, to the fact that if we look now at the radius, 
of lithium-6 for the blue inter inter uh, interaction is slightly underestimated. So this relation between a charger IDI and a charge form factor is uh, encoded here, basically. And similar description also we have for the uh, longitudinal form factor for uh, carbon-12. Well, here uh, we um, uh, basically have now the red interaction, the caral interaction, uh, underestimated a little bit the, the peak, but we basically expect that with the truncation error, with the truncation of the theory, this is um, in good agreement with the experimental data. So a complementary, another complementary calculation that we can perform in the quantum Monte Carlo method is the two nucleon density, which now this describe the special distribution of a correlated pair in uh, a correlated pair of nucleons in a nucleon, in a, in a nucleus. And here we have the neutron proton and the proton proton uh, density, density distribution. And again, the different panel, uh, they basically consider a different interaction model. And they have been calculated for a selected um, nuclear, for a selecting num selected number of nuclei. So what we can see here is that within a fixed uh, interaction, uh, the two nucleon density for uh, relative distance that they are less than roughly 1.5 Fermi, they show basically they exhibit a similar behavior. And this similar behavior, it's basically due to the, the cooperation of the short range repulsion and the intermediate range tensor attraction, uh, attraction of the nucleon nucleon interaction with the uh, tensor force here of, um, dominating the overshooting of in the neutron proton pair compared to the proton proton pair. So um, of course we can also, so this is one way to present these two nucleon density, but we can also provide the full probability density as a function of the relative distance and the center of mass um, of the pair, they, they can be uh, calculated. They are more expensive to, uh, to calculate, but the calculation can be, can be done. So another, um, I think, quantity that we can calculate within our quantum Monte Carlo methods that is not strictly uh, in the light, nuclei, light nuclei sector is the equation of state of pure neutron matter. So now the equation of state, which is relevant, uh, of pure neutron matter, which is relevant to study, for example, neutron star, play an important role uh, for us for testing the microscopic model uh, Hamiltonian that we have fit to nuclear nucleon scattering data as well as a few body observable against astrophysical constraint. So specifically the pure, uh, pure neutron matter calculation equation of state is sensitive to the parametrization of the three body force. So therefore we can learn through this calculation, we can basically learn about play an important role in understanding the role of three body force. So this is a recent calculation that we have performed. We have performed first a benchmark calculation uh, using three many body um, system, because we know that many body calculation of course are affected by approximation that they are inherent to the method used to solve the, the many body Schrodinger equation. Therefore, it's important to gauge the systematics of this calculation. So this is um, a benchmark calculation between the auxiliary field diffusion Monte Carlo, the Fermi Epernet chain, and the Bruckner artery fork. And what we notice is that there is a good uh, comparison between the auxiliary field and the Bruckner artery fork up to uh, density uh, two times saturation density. While the Fermi Epernet chain, the agreement is good up to one time saturation density, but then it starts to deviate when we go higher in density. Well, here in this panel, we have auxiliary field diffusion Monte Carlo calculation now for 
uh, the different um, chiral model that we have. And this band, it's basically indicates the model dependence of the equation of state uh, from this, um, due to this interaction. And what we see is that at two times saturation density, um, the model dependence, it's roughly seven, 16 MeV uh, energy per, per nucleon. So now, of course, to have a full description of the properties of a nuclear system, such as magnetic moment and decays, as I said, we also need to specify the charge and current operator uh, associated to the Hamiltonian. So now the charge and current operator describe basically the interaction of nuclei with the external field, such as the electroweak field. And they are written in a sum of one body and two body operators. And in principle, we can have many body operator. The one body operator basically describe the interaction of the external field with the one nucleon at the time. While the two body operators, the two body currents, they describe the interaction of the external field with a pair of correlated nucleons. So now the uh, current and charge, the charge and current operator have been developed in conjunction with the phenomenological interaction using meson exchange uh, theories. And also more recently, they've been constructed in, um, in the chiral effective field theory approach. And they've been derived uh, in both the electromagnetic and uh, weak sector. So now what type of calculation we can do to test uh, now the current operator is basically calculate um, the uh, elastic electros nucleus scattering, which is a testing ground for the model of the electromagnetic many body operators. Here are, um, for example, a calculation of the magnetic form factor in tritum and helium-3. And here we have the contribution of the, the current at, in this basically chiral expansion, where at leading order, we have the one body operators, and then we start to have two body effects. So now this figure basically show the magnetic uh, form factor of helium-3 and triton. And what we notice here is that, and we, this calculation have been done both with the phenomenological and the chiral interaction. And what we notice is that at leading order, so in the, in the current, meaning that we are taking only the one body. So the form factor are underestimated while when we start to include two body effects, two body currents, we are reproducing better the experimental data, which are basically given by these dots. And so th this is basically telling us that two body currents, the two body effects are important to explain the experimental data. And this can be also seen if we analyzed, for example, the magnetic radii, Again, at leading order, uh, we have these values and then the inclusion of two body effects tends to bring the theory much closer to the experiment. So now other nuclear observable that they are important to test the model of electromagnetic operator are the magnetic moments and the electro electromagnetic uh, transition decays. <clears throat> In this panel, we basically have the green function of Monte Carlo calculation using the phenomenological interaction and the electromagnetic chiral uh, effective field theory current. We call this calculation hybrid calculation because we are using two different theoretical framework for um, uh, interaction and current. And this is a calculation that was performed by Pastore and collaborator where they basically calculating the magnetic moment for nuclei up to A equal, A equal 10. So, and what we observe here again, so here we have a calculation, for, those are green function Monte Carlo calculation using only the um, um, one body operator and then the full, which is the blue, and then the full, which is the red, they includes the two body effects. Now, if we pick, for example, <clears throat> um, for example, carbon, carbon nine here, 
we see that the, the impulse approximation calculation um, is uh, placed the, the calculation here, while when we include the two body effect, we are getting much more closer to the experimental data. So, and this is a similar picture that we see in the electromagnetic uh, decays. So those are the, um, the uh, this right, right panel shows the electromagnetic transition induced by the M1 and the one operators in the nuclei up to A equal nine. And what we notice again, it's the importance of this, the inclusion of the two body effects to, uh, to get in agreement with the experimental data. So other observable that we have recently calculated um, are the um, single beta decay matrix element. So those observable are experimentally well known at the sub percent level. So therefore they are used primarily to validate our microscopic uh, uh, modeling of the nucleus. So here we have a single beta decay matrix element calculated uh, up to A equal 12 by Pastore and collaborators. And again, here we have the green function Monte Carlo calculation using only the one body operator the green function of Monte Carlo using one body and two body operators. And they are compared also with the shell model calculation. <clears throat> now, the overall message here of this calculation is that um, the inclusion, again, the inclusion of the two body effects is important to have uh, the agreement with the experimental data. Indeed, we see how the shell model is quite far from uh, the experimental data and he needs a quenching in order to reach, and the theory here will need a quenching in order to uh, reach the uh, experimental data. Now, those calculations were performed again using the argon, the phenomenological and the chiral current, which is this hybrid, hybrid calculation. But more recently, we have performed a calculation using uh, both the north uh, the chiral interaction and the chiral ca current which is a much more consistent calculation but the fundings of this calculation was basically the same of the previous calculation done in an hybrid an hybrid way so now leptus nucleus scattering now in a wide range of energy and momentum transfer is also crucial for not only for the nuclear physics program to try to understand um, uh, nuclear physics, but, but also for current and planned neutrino oscillation experiment as well as fundamental physics program. So we are using the short time approximation technique which basically allow us to calculate the response function, which are given by the scattering from a correlated pair uh, in the nucleus that propagates um, into a correlated pair of nucleons in the final state. Now, this technique allow us to retain both the two body correlation and currents and the, uh, at the vertex. And also it's a more, uh, it's a more flexible, let's say it, it is a method that is uh, based on a factorization approach. Therefore, a more exclusive processes can also be included in this type of, um, of uh, technique. So this short time of this approach has been recently applied by Pastore and collaborator to the quasi-elastic electron scattering on, alpha, on the alpha particle. And here an example of the transverse density at momentum transfer of uh, 400 as a function of the relative energy of the pair and the center of mass uh, energy. So more recently, this technique uh, has been basically compared with the green function Monte Carlo calculation, which, which, which has been widely used in order to extract this response function. And so these panels basically show the uh, differential cross section uh, as a function of the energy transfer for different energy of the initial beam and different angles. Uh, 
Now, the funding of this uh, comparison uh, is that the green function and short time approximation both describe experimental data in the quasi-elastic peak for momentum transfers that they range from the 300 to 600 MeV. When we go higher to these, um, to, in, to, in the momentum transfer, so these um, techniques, they start to deviate from the experimental data. And this is because we need basically the inclusion in that kinematics of, for example, relativistic correction. So here a summary of, um, of um, the talk. So there's been a tremendous, so the message here is that has been a tremendous progress in ab initio theory. So, and this is to study nuclear system, both uh, at atomic nuclei as well as uh, infinite matter. And this is mainly due to the increase of the algorithm efficiency. We have uh, the advent of effective field theory and uncertainty quantification as well. So another important progress is that the microscopic description of nuclei is a powerful tool to basically elucidate the role of two-body effect in both nuclear interaction and currents. And for example, through the quantum Monte Carlo calculation uh, of nuclei of quantities of the structure of nuclei up to A equal 12, we can see how two-body correction can be sizable and improve the agreement of theory with the experiment. Another important progress is the possibility now within this uh, microscopic approach to perform a consistent calculation for nuclei and infinite matter, meaning that we can connect nuclei observables to astrophysical quantities and observation. Of course, there are still improvements that we need to perform uh, still, the realistic nuclear interaction does not give a good uh, description of, uh, of data, for example, if we start to go higher, heavier in nuclei. So, and then there are all these questions also how to refine this nuclear interaction, which type of observable to use, in which mass, mass range, uh, improvement of the uncertainty quantification of the theory, as well as improvements in the formulation of the three nuclear force. And also another more uh, needs, it's that we need also a much deeper a quantitative understanding of the connection between properties of matter and uh, nuclei. So and with this, I would like to thank um, my group at uh, WashU, the Quantum Monte Carlo Group for Nuclear Physics, in particular, the young people. And, and then, uh, of course, uh, thank you for uh, the attention and here um, the list of my collaborators. So thank you very much. Thank you for the very impressive talk. So now the uh, questions from the audience. The, the first question is from Christoph. Yes, so I have, in fact, two questions. The first one is the following. In the kinetic energy, you have pi square over, uh, or p, uh, p square over 2m and also p4 over 8m cubed as the next term of the expansion. Mm -hmm. So do you include this p4 term in the, on the variational level? No, we, we well, we don't, but we fit... Um... Moment. So we don't, you don't include it at all or you include it on a later stage? Uh, but uh, which kind of expansion are you talking about? Look, so whether... Because you you may treat some uh, sometimes on the perturbative level, not mm -hmm. on not on the variational level. Because once you construct a Hamiltonian, you find the wave function. But you may also find out the wave function on some simplified Hamiltonian and then include high order terms perturbatively. So yeah. my question is do, that you neglect completely P4, uh, P to the four term. Yes, yeah, so we just include the neural activistic P square over two, but then the idea is that higher order in that expansion can be basically reabsorbed in the fitting of the low energy constant of the parameters that we have in the interaction. <clears throat> so I understand, but I don't agree with this, <laughs> this before. And the second question, I am not a nuclear physicist, I am an atomic physicist, but sometimes I need a, a different uh, formulation of electromagnetic interaction. What I mean is the following, that you include electromagnetic interaction not as a current, some external expression, but within the Hamiltonian. So all the terms in the Hamiltonian 
are gauge covariant. Or maybe the, because you have to introduce, you find out the current using minimal coupling scheme, but sometimes you have to also include some terms beyond the minimal coupling scheme. So what I would like to have that within the Hamiltonian, which you derive mm -hmm. for, uh, to construct the, your wave function, I would like to have a fully in, implemented algorithmic interaction with all the couplings, because this will allow me for myself to calculate many other things which you haven't even mentioned in your in your talk. But there are other problems important, for example, muonic atoms, which we are not, not able to calculate because of the lack of appropriate formulation of automatic interaction. So what we need is the implementation of automatic interaction on the level of Hamiltonian, including P4 of the term, or including P, P to the fourth, because it's crucial for, uh, for um, consistency. Thank you. Yeah, I, I agree with you, but you have also to consider that, you know, the nuclear interaction, as well as the current, they are, they have parameters, right? So in a, re, in a way, you know, these kind of effects, they are incorporated in the, uh, in the definition of these constants. Yes, but we need something more than current because we also need uh, uh, two, uh, the Seagal terms, or means more complicated operators, we not only this current. And for this reason, we need the implementation of interaction within the Hamiltonian because we, we need terms beyond the current. But the Seagal term is a current, right? Oh, it's, it's, it's the Seagal terms is just one example, yeah. but there are many more. And that is the reason that for your application, it is enough, but not for general applications. Okay. But this is a, a uh, comment to all of the nuclear, uh, nuclear physicists, not only to you. Thank you. Uh, we can have one more question from Gordon Drake. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, yeah, again, thank you for a very interesting talk. Uh, but I was just wondering uh, about the three nucleon case. Um, has anyone, uh, it's really possible to do much more accurate calculations using uh, correlated Hilarus coordinates, just as in the uh, electronic case. So just wondering, has anyone tried doing that as a, uh, of course, there's still be uncertainties for, uh, from the, uh, the effective field theory and the effective interactions, mm -hmm. but, uh, but the, the structure part should be, it should be possible to solve uh, using Hilarus coordinates. Has anyone tried doing that? Uh... That I'm aware, I don't know. So uh, but you are talking of which part of the three bodies? Gordon is not aware of the fact that you have to anti-symmetrize, for example, 12 nucleons. That is the problem. It is not a three-body problem. It's a 12 nucleon. If you anti-symmetrize 12, you are killed by the... By, uh, yeah, by why, the why 12? Why, for, say, helium-3, why, why was it 12? Ah, no, for helium three, it's only three. You're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Same yeah. So, I mean, yeah, sure. For the more complicated case, you'd be killed by the uh, anti symmetry, just as in the electronic case. Yeah, you but can... you can use Gaussians equally well. You can use Gaussians equally well. You can use Gaussians. That, yeah. Because that, it's yeah, not you're, a point you're, system. They are yeah. not point interactions. Haleras yeah. is very much suited for point interactions. Because yeah, they well, that's right. Yeah, it's not a point interaction. Satisfy the cast condition. For nuclei, you don't need to satisfy cast condition. Gaussians are, are very efficient. Gaussian, sure, outcome. yeah, yeah, but you, but you can still use uh, with Gaussian still use uh, in, include explicitly the uh, the uh, R one two term. What you call yeah, the but they use term. because they introduce yeah just a factor. So they they include they include the explicit correlations. Yeah, they are there. The correlation are them. Because but is your impression that in helium three there is no there is a lack of accuracy from the numerical method because numerically helium three and and um, the bound state problem. And for tritium, it's not a big deal. Like, yeah, but it's you, you have to understand, Gordon is speaking about 10 digits, not about uh, two or three digits. Yeah, but the nuclear Hamiltonian, that, that, the current. Yeah, it doesn't, the, doesn't have that much the, precision. Yeah. The, the, the yes, nuclear Hamiltonian doesn't give you 10 this digits. This is atomic anyway. physics point okay. of view on this <laughs> people. This is, uh, people I this think is. now it's time for us to move to the next talk. My name is Silvia Mayer Dresko, and I'm a PhD student at MIT working with uh, Ronald. And today I'm going to talk about uh, parity violation using molecular ions. So, uh, in this talk, first I want to start by explaining why molecules are very sensitive to nuclear effects, and in particular, what advantages we have when using molecules compared to using atoms. Uh, 
And I'm going to present some preliminary results from some experiments in which we show that sensitivity to parity conserving effects. And then I'm going to move to parity violation effects in molecule. And first, I'm going to talk about them a bit on the theoretical side and emphasize the need for accurate uh, nuclear and molecular calculations in order to understand better the nuclear properties from this experiment. And then I'm going to describe a new experiment that we are uh, designing and building here at uh, MIT that aims to measure such nuclear parity violation effect in molecules. And then I'm going to briefly talk about the future direction that we can take uh, with measuring parity violations in molecules. So as it was already mentioned in previous talks, molecules are a lot more complicated than um, atoms. While in atoms, the main energy scale is the electronic one, which is on the order of uh, one electron volt. In the molecules, we have a lot more energy levels. Uh, each electronic state has a few vibrational levels, and each vibrational levels can have a few hundred to a thousand rotational levels. And on top of the... Oh, sorry. Uh, on top of this, we can have other effects. For example, if we have nuclear spin, we have hyperfine interactions, and we can also have uh, more exotic terms in the Hamiltonian, like the parity violation and PT violation terms. And for example, the energy splitting between two rotational levels, and this rotational Hamiltonian is specific to all the molecule, regardless of the nuclear properties. So the splitting between these two levels is, for example, about five orders of magnitude uh, smaller than the splitting between the electronic levels in atoms. So overall, the spectra of a molecule is very congested and it's very hard to perform spectroscopy on molecules, but at the same time, uh, they offer a lot more opportunities in certain areas compared to atoms. And another advantage that molecules offer is related to the electron cloud. So while in the atomic case, for example, in the radium plus uh, ion, the electron cloud is um, spheric spherically symmetric, it's an S orbital. So we are not um, sensitive to higher order, uh, higher order nuclear moments. In the molecular case, for example, in the radium fluoride molecule, the electron from the radium goes to the fluorine. So the radium plus ion basically fills the strong electric field that uh, exists between these two ions. And the electron cloud around the radium plus uh, ion is highly polarized. So it's not anymore just an uh, S orbital, but it's a combination, a linear combination of S, P1 half and P3 half. So in this way, the um, electron cloud is uh, sensitive to high order nuclear moments, even in the ground state, such as the electric quadrupole or magnetic octopole uh, moments of the radium uh, nucleus. So basically we can measure these high order moments just by staying in the electronic ground state of the molecule without ever performing optical excitations. And we can do this measurement by looking at different rotational transitions. And these rotational transitions in the ground state have very long lifetime. So we can measure this very uh, precisely. We are basically limited by the interaction time between the RF or microwave field and the molecules rather than the lifetime of the excited states. So here I want to show some preliminary results from an experiment that we perform on the radium-225 fluoride. So radium fluoride is very interesting because it's one of the main candidates for measurement of uh, EDM and parity violation effect, especially nuclear spin dependent on like shift moment or magnetic quadrupole moments. And um, here we, we, draw, we actually measure optical transitions, not uh, RF as I mentioned earlier. So we, we drove transitions between two electronic levels uh, here denoted by sigma and pi. So basically uh, each, as I mentioned, each electronic levels has several vibrational levels and each vibrational levels have rotational levels. So in this experiment, we drove transitions between different rotational levels of the two electronic states. And what you see here is one such transitions between two rotational levels. So in the absence of hyperfine structure, this will be only one peak, but because uh, radium 225 has spin one half, we see this uh, splitting of that original peaks into multiple uh, smaller peaks which shows that even when doing an optical transition, so we are limited by the lifetime of this excited electronic state, which is about 50 nanoseconds or even lower, we are still able to clearly see the hyperfine splitting and uh, clearly see the peaks. And again, if we are to perform this measurement only in the rotational uh, levels of the ground electronic state, we would be able to, to see these peaks a lot, uh, a lot narrower and a lot uh, more clear. But even here, we are uh, able to see the spectra very well. And another advantage of using molecules compared to atom is that while in atom you have only one spectra per electronic structure, basically, 
uh, in molecules, you actually have one spectra per rotational transition. So basically by measuring different, uh, or by measuring transitions between different rotational levels between these two electronic states, we, we basically got one such spectra for each rotational transition. And uh, this allowed us to constrain the hyperfine parameter very well. And also, for example, uh, learn things be, uh, about the, the interplay between the rotation and hyperfine effects in the molecule. And in terms of the, the nuclear structure, what we want to extract from this spectra is the, the magnetic uh, moment of the radium-225. And uh, this is the results that we got. Again, these are just some preliminary results. We are still um, analyzing the data. So in principle, uh, the, the way you can extract the magnetic moment, uh, there are two main ways. You can either perform a Larmor precession experiment and the value obtained through this uh, measurement in uh, atoms. This is a previous measurement is shown here at the bottom. And uh, the other way is to measure the hyperfine uh, constant of an atom or a molecule and using atomic theory extract the, the magnetic moment from there. And this is what I'm showing in this table. So the, uh, this first column shows the magnetic moment extracted from the hyperfine structure of radium fluoride, which is what I showed uh, before. And this is from previous results performed on uh, radium ion. And uh, the important thing is that here, the first line shows the result when we account for the born viscov effect. So basically in the theoretical calculations for the electronic structure, we include the born viscov effect, which again, means that the nucleus is uh, not a point-like, but it has a distribution of the magnetizations. And these uh, theory calculations were made by uh, Leonid in this uh, paper. And the second line shows the same uh, results when we assume that the nucleus is point-like. And uh, the important thing to notice is that we are clearly seeing the effect of this nuclear magnetization as our result is in good agreement with these previous results and is in a, a clear uh, significant disagreement with the calculations without the born viscov effect. So the important thing is that uh, even at this uh, kind of experiments where we, draw, where we drive optical, not RF transitions, we are still very sensitive to tiny nuclear effects. So the born viscov effect is expected to be about 4% in, in radium. And uh, this is encouraging going forward because uh, if we want to measure parity or PTO effects in uh, radium fluoride and other radioactive molecules, we need to be very sensitive to, to nuclear effects. And while this was, uh, predicted to be the case theoretically, it's it's nice to actually that we actually showed experimentally at least to a certain degree that this is the case. And uh, also the theoretical calculations of the hyperfine constants are in very good agreement with the experimental values. And uh, this is also encouraging because we need similar calculations in order to extract nuclear parameters, uh, 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 parasymmetry violating nuclear parameters from uh, future experiments. And at least to our knowledge, this is the first time that the born vascov effect was uh, measured in a molecule. So this was about parity conserving effects in molecule. And uh, I showed that in order to prove that molecules are very sensitive to nuclear effects. So going back to this Hamiltonian, we, in our group, we already explored the electronic and vibrational structure of um, radium fluoride. And currently we are working on analyzing the data that will show the rotational and hyperfine structure. And uh, I, I the, the, this is the spectra that I showed you before. And again, this is the first time uh, this was done in a short-lived radioactive molecule. So the next natural step is to start looking at the parity violation effects. And this is what I'm gonna focus on for the rest of the talk. So um, the molecules also offer here many advantages compared to atoms. The, the most important one is that the parity violation effects can be treated to first order in perturbation theory. So the effect scales as the inverse of the energy difference between two levels of opposite parity. And uh, this is the case that uh, the two, two consecutive rotational levels do have indeed opposite parity. So just by using a molecule without any external uh, electric or magnetic field, we already get uh, five orders of magnitude enhancement compared to the atoms just by performing this measurement between rotational rather than electronic levels. And if on top of this, we apply, for example, a strong magnetic field that brings two such levels close to degeneracy, we can get further enhancement in molecules compared to atoms. So in uh, atomic and molecular physics, the, the parity violation effect manifests itself in two main ways. We have uh, nuclear spin independent effects, which uh, this is the main Feynman diagram. We have a Z boson exchange with the axial vertex on the electron side. And uh, from here, we can extract the weak charge of the nucleus. And this was done in atomic uh, spectroscopic experiments for several nuclei. 
And then we have nuclear spin dependent effects, which are um, the one showed here on the, um, the right. So the first one is also a Z boson exchange, but the axial vertex is on the, the nucleus side. And from this kind of experiment, we can uh, learn this uh, C2, U, and D parameters of the weak interaction, basically the axial coupling of the electron with the up and down quark. And we can also search for more exotic uh, physics, like new mediators between the electrons and the nucleons. The second effect is the so-called anapole moment, which is a magnetic uh, moment that appears due to the hadronic parity violation. And this effect scales at, uh, as a power of uh, Z cube. So basically, this is the dominant nuclear spin dependent effect in a heavy system, while uh, the first one is the one dominating in light system. And we have also a third uh, Feynman diagram, which is usually uh, much smaller than the other two. And this uh, appears due to an interference between this nuclear spin independent uh, term and the hyperfine interaction between the electron and the, the nucleus. So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to mainly talk about these uh, two main uh, nuclear spin uh, dependent interaction. And another advantage of molecule that I need to mention is that while uh, in atom, this nuclear spin independent term is dominating, uh, it can be shown that in molecule actually, to the same degree in a perturbation theory, this uh, term is identically zero. So basically, on top of this large enhancement in molecule, we can get a clear measurement of this nuclear spin independent effect, which is very difficult to do in atoms. And it has actually been done only once in the cesium atom. Um, so this anapole moment that I mentioned is basically, and that we want to measure through this molecular experiment in particular, is a um, um, moment that uh, appears at the nuclear level because of the hadronic parity violation between the, the nucleons. And um, classically, you can think of the anapole moment as uh, a moment that appears when you have a current distribution in this toroidal shape. And uh, it's given by this uh, integral of the current distribution. And basically, this anapole moment vector gives rise to a vector potential, which then interacts electromagnetically with the magnetic moment of the electron. And this is how we get the parity violation effects at the atomic or molecular level. And uh, in molecules, the effect of this anapole moment um, is uh, quantified by this matrix element. So it's the matrix element between two rotational levels of opposite parity. And it can be written as a product of three terms. The first one is the nuclear part. So this has to do with anapole moment itself. And we need to calculate this using uh, nuclear uh, structure calculations. The second one, this WA, has to do with the electronic structure of the molecule. And usually it can be calculated uh, quite well with something around 3 to 5% uh, relative uncertainty in many systems. And this C parameter is uh, a term of order one that can be calculated analytically. And it has to do with the rotational wave function of the molecule. So this whole uh, term is denoted by IW, where uh, this emphasizes that the term is imaginary, which needs to be the case for a POT even interaction. And this is basically the term that we, we want to measure. So basically, in order to get good prediction uh, from this, we do need very good prediction of this uh, Ka parameter. And here I'm showing some uh, results obtained from this paper, where they calculate this uh, Ka parameter for this five uh, nuclei. So on top, they do the calculation using the no core shell model uh, calculations. And here in the bottom, I'm showing the results obtained using the single particle model calculations. And as you can see, the, the differences are quite large. For example, for carbon-13, the, the predicted value using ab initio uh, calculations is four times larger than using single particle model calculations. So basically what I want to emphasize is that we do need uh, ab initio complex calculations in order to get a clear picture of this anapole moment uh, effect. And ideally we would like to, to have calculations that extend beyond magnesium 25, because for example, in this first experiment that we want to perform, we will aim to measure the anapole moment of silicon 29, but then we, we would like to go to higher elements, even barium and radium. So ideally we want um, accurate calculations of these uh, K parameters. So in terms of the um, uh, experimental scheme that we want to, to perform, so um, what we want to do is to start with these two rotational levels, which are, as I mentioned, split by something on the order of 10 gigahertz in the molecules that we are interested in.
And uh, this two level system is described by this Hamiltonian where E is the energy splitting between these two levels. And this is the off diagonal part evaluation term. And the idea is to populate only one of those levels. And then uh, after a certain period of time, uh, the population will get transferred to the other parity level due to this off diagonal term. And experimentally, you want to measure how much of the population got transferred to the other uh, parity level. And uh, at this stage, the transition rate is proportional to W square over E square. And this term is too small to, to measure in practice. So the first thing we can do to improve this is to apply a magnetic field. So if we apply the proper magnetic field, we can bring these two levels very close together. So in, a, in our case, we expect that we can get a further seven orders of magnitude enhancement. And uh, this is showed in this plot uh, uh, where I show the energy uh, of the rotational of the ground of, of the lowest two rotational states of silicon oxide plus as a function of the magnetic field. And so basically this uh, black line shows the evolution of the ground rotational levels where uh, this plus one half is the projection of the electron spin on the on the z axis in the lab frame and this is the projection of the rotational moment and these three lines going downwards uh, show the evolution of the um, rotational uh, of the first rotational levels where again minus one half is the electronic spin and plus one zero and minus one are the projection of the rotational angular momentum on the z axis and as you can see we have uh, three points where these lines interact which happens at around 1.5 tesla which is a magnetic field that can be quite easily achieved in lab. And the point is that uh, where we have this uh, almost degeneracy in practice, it will be an avoided crossing because we have this of diagonal terms, but at this uh, almost interaction points, we expect to get large enhancement relative to the atoms. And uh, Professor David Demils showed that in barium fluoride, we can get up to uh, 11 orders of magnitude enhancement compared to the atomic system. So in this case, the transition rate scales at uh, W square over delta square, which is a lot better than before, but it's still too small for us to measure experimentally. So the last thing that we can do is to apply uh, an oscillating electric field and perform a so-called Stark interference. So if we do this, we would add an extra term on the diagonal, which uh, is this uh, Stark inter uh, interaction term. And it turns out that now the transition rate has a term that is proportional to this W, multiplied by the electric field. And uh, that term is significantly bigger than this W square term. And through that term, we can actually extract this, uh, this W. So again, the idea is to, to see how much of the population got transferred from an initial parity state to the other. And from there, we can extract the, the W. So the actual experiment that we propose is this one. We, we want to measure uh, the, the, the parity violation effects in uh, silicon 29. So we will start with a silicon rod that we will um, ablate and then we will inject helium and oxygen and we will have a supersonic expansion of silicon oxide molecules. Then with a second laser, we will uh, ionize the molecule to silicon oxide plus and using some electrostatic uh, optics, we will guide the molecules towards the interaction region. And at these levels, the, the energy splitting between these ground two rotational states is on the order of 10 gigahertz. We don't have a magnetic field applied yet. Then the ions, and actually we will perform the experiment one ion at a time. The ion will enter in this uh, detection region in a so-called panning trap, which is an ion trap that uses magnetic and electric field to trap the ion at the center. So inside this trap, the, the ion, uh, beside being uh, fixed at the center, basically, it fills this strong magnetic field, which is bringing this two level close to degeneracy, which is what we want to do. And it also fills this time oscillating electric field, which uh, contributes to this transfer of the population. So what we do first after the ion enters the trap is to bring the population, bring basically the electron to the to this ground state in one of the parity levels. And then after a period of time under the evolution of this time varying field and the W, we are transferring probabilistically speaking population to the other parity level. And after that, we are exciting the molecule from this negative parity state to an auto dissociative state. So if this transfer of population happened, the molecule will dissociate and we will end up with the oxygen and silicon plus. And then we will uh, send the, the resulting products from the center of the trap to an ion detector. And based on the time of flight, we can uh, tell if we still have a silicon oxide plus, in which case this transfer didn't happen, 
or if we have a silicon plus in which we actually dissociated the molecule. So by counting how many events end up with a silicon plus, with a yeah, with a silicon plus instead of silicon oxide plus, we can extract the W uh, parameter. So in terms of the numbers that we expect from this experiment, this is the statistical uh, uncertainty prediction. So here n is the molecular rate, which we expect to measure about one per second. T is the integration time, which I assume here to be one day. This W contains this uh, K and WA. And so in the silicon, K is about 0.1 and WA was calculated by Anastasia to be about 16 Hertz. And the tau is the interaction or coherence time, which we assume to be hundred milliseconds. So from here, we get a relative statistical uncertainty of around 12, 13%. Then in terms of systematic, the main one is the thermal noise. So we will actually have to cool down the trap at around four Kelvin, but even there, the thermal noise will be about 10% relative uncertainty. We also have about three to 5% relative uncertainty due to the molecular calculations uncertainties. And then we have some extra smaller uh, uncertainties due to the electric and magnetic field, which are below 1%. So overall, the expected uncertainty using this quite um, conservative estimates uh, is something around 15, 16% relative uncertainty in the, the value that we expect to extract for this W parameter, this uh, nuclear, uh, for, for actually for this K parameter, the nuclear spin uh, dependent effect in, in silicon 29. So in terms of the status of the experiment, we are pretty much done with the simulation. So we are quite confident that uh, everything is it's good, at least uh, in, in principle. And we are also working on uh, building the experiment at MIT. We are pretty much done with the laser setup. We, we have the magnet that should be delivered to MIT in a, about a month or so. We are done with the electronics and other uh, elements like the ion optics and the, the frames that will hold the magnet. So in principle, we hope that in about one month, we will be able to, to do some preliminary test and we will actually start with the room temperature um, set up in the beginning. Uh, in terms of molecular calculations, so this plot shows the value of this WA parameter as a function of the atomic number and silicon oxide is around here at 16 um, hertz. And as you can see, there are many other um, elements that have a WA bigger than silicon oxide. So in principle, all these elements are suitable for the, the similar experiments. So ideally, we, we should be able to measure nuclear spin-dependent parity violation effects in most of these uh, nuclei. And this basically calls again for accurate nuclear calculations in order to, to use this experiment to, to learn more about hadronic parity violations. And again, in the future, we hope to extend, uh, to extend even more to, to radium and even to the actinide elements. So in terms of the next step for this experiment, as I mentioned, we will start with the room temperature panning trap setup. Hopefully we'll start uh, working on that uh, this or next month. Uh, first, we want to perform a laser spectroscopy of silicon 28 oxide uh, ion in the trap, which is, uh, as far as we know, the first time this is done on a molecular ion uh, in a panning trap. And uh, here we want to prove that we can bring this to level close to degeneracy. Uh, then we want to study the hyperfine structure of 29 silicon oxide plus. This will be done uh, outside of the panning trap because we need to, to understand very well the hyperfine structure of this ion, which will be the main one that we will use for the parity violation measurements. Then uh, next year or so, we hope to actually start installing and performing systematic studies of the cryogenic setup, the one at 4 Kelvin. And uh, ideally in the next few years, we hope using this setup to actually perform a non-zero measurement of the, the nuclear spin-dependent parity violation effect in this silicon oxide plus molecule. And again, we really, we, we really need accurate calculations in order to, to better understand the, the, the effects that come at play at the nuclear level, this parity violation effects. And thinking even more in the future, we using a similar setup, we can aim to measure weak quadrupole moments and even further in the future, we might be able to perform similar measurement in polyatomic like chiral molecular ions in which we can get a significantly higher enhancement of this uh, parity violation effects because in chiral molecule, these effects appear at first order in perturbation theory. And for example, using chiral molecule, we can get very precise measurement of the weak uh, charge. And for example, from there, if we do this measurement in several isotopes, we can learn about the neutron scheme. But again, this is more in the future.
And uh, I want to thank our collaborators. So this is our group at MIT, but this collabor this experiment is in done is done in collaboration with uh, many other people with different expertise. So we are working with Caltech, University of Chicago, Efriban, uh, Triumph, and yeah, I want to thank uh, everyone who helped us, and they are still helping us with this experiment. Thank you.